Lions J here. Welcome to Models Memories Weekly, episode 119. Models Memories is a show about nothing and is filmed in front of a live studio audience. This is a show where I talk about my painting, modeling, and wargaming experiences from the week. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Jay, you put out three DVDs a week and you stream twice a week. How? Could I possibly have more to say? Well, I do. And here goes. This week, I actually got a bunch of stuff done for my Black Templars, mostly building stuff, and I ran into a little snag with list building because Games Workshop has sort of fundamentally changed how list building works in Warhammer 40,000. But first, I want to show off Reclusiac Merrick Beverly Grimaldus. Even though High Marshal Halbrecht is like the big, awesome, cool guy of the Black Templars, Grimaldus is the real guy, especially because of the novel Hell's Reach, which is a fantastic Black Templar novel all about Grimaldus and how he became the hero of Hell's Reach. And he's sort of on his way to becoming another Imperial Saint, which uh, which is like we've only seen it with Celestine and maybe the um, the fiery Space Marines, the chaotic Space Marines sometimes called the Firehawks, before they turned into the Legion of the Damned. But it would be really funny if he became an Imperial Saint. Well, it'd be really cool if he became an Imperial Saint, but it'd be really funny because then he would be psychic and the Black Templar hate psychers above all else. I mean, they'll barely, they're barely willing to deal with astropaths. And if he somehow had psychic abilities or just seemed to be touched by the warp, it might cause a little bit of a rift in the Black Templar. Maybe they might be able to get over it and he might just become the coolest guy ever, but man, good old Merrick Beverly Grimaldus, he's just so cool. And he comes with his little duders, and he's really good. He seems really good. Him with a 20 man Crusader blob, which is going to take a very long time to paint, but hopefully I can get it done in a timely manner so I can actually get this guy on the tabletop. I'm super excited to actually get my Black Templar up and running. They were so bad. They were so bad in sixth edition and seventh edition and eighth edition. My army slowly transformed from being a, a classic Black Templar close combat focused army to uh, just a normal Space Marine shooty army because there was just back in the day, there was like no good close combat for the Space Marines. There was nothing. A regular Space Marine with a chain sword was so much worse than a Space Marine with a bolter. But now they are ready for close combat. Every single thing that can take a power sword or a chain sword is going to be bringing those weapons. I might maybe let a Razorback or something into the army just so that I can have a little bit of some some damage dealing against heavy vehicles because there's not that many super crazy high strength weapons available in close combat. Like I, it's going to be really hard to punch tanks to death, especially with Sean's Basilisks being able to indirect fire me and apply the uh, the slow or the take cover because then all of my movement characteristics are are negated by two which is particularly bad for my Necrons who only have a movement of five. So all of a sudden it's like they're moving three inches, advancing one inch, and then they, they roll a six on the charge, which actually means they rolled a four on, like it's impossible. But ah, the Black Templar, I am ready to rip and tear. Super, super excited. I was thinking about, cause I've just spent some money on my Black Templar and I was thinking maybe I was spending a little bit more money on my Black Templar. I was thinking about getting the new Hellbrick model because it is absolutely amazing. And Marco Frassoni, no just make a, he did a beautiful video painting up that model absolutely perfectly, but I already have one. I already have one. This is from War Game Exclusive, and it's just really nice, especially when before the new model came out. And this, this guy is so unbelievably better than the old Finecast one. The old Finecast one had its moments, but it had tiny little Kelvin and Hobbes, little baby boy legs, where this model is standing just big and proud. And I actually think this model does stabbing an orc a little bit better because this orc feels like he's really, really struggling where the other one looks like he's already super, super dead. And I mean, it's just it's just so perfect. It's, it's Nick's blue orc dead on the base. So I don't know if I need to replace this model with the new one. And they're about the same size. The new one is on a much bigger base. So maybe I'll have to add it or either rebase this guy or just glue him onto another base and like add a little base baseball pitchers mound of earth to make it a little bit seamless, but I don't know. I really like this miniature. I think it turned out really nice and it has led my Black Templar before. So I don't know if he's ready to be sent out to pasture just yet to live out his days happily on a farm, but list building in Warhammer 40,000 because I've been writing lists for my Necrons and for my Black Templar and it's fundamentally different from how it used to be 
And there's one change that I really like and one change that I, I, I don't like as much, but I think both of them can easily be the way it's done moving forward. I know I've read hundreds of comments of people being like, 40K is dead. I'm quitting Warhammer. I'll never touch the game again. Though we get those comments happen every single edition of Warhammer 40,000. And for the most part, it's a lot like you, you're still going to play. You're still going to play or you're still going to continue to not play because you don't you're not a big Warhammer player. But I don't think the new the changes to list building are actually that egregious or that big a change, even though they are very different. And those two changes are uh, the points aren't based per miniature, but they're based per squad. And so you have strict squad sizes. Usually there's a min squad and a max squad that can lead to some problems and all upgrades are free. All upgrades are free. I absolutely love. However, it does lead to some weirdness for some units. But first, I want to talk about the squad sizes. So having a min and a maximum squad is the same way that Age of Sigmar does stuff, although the list building is not exactly the same as it is in Age of Sigmar. And Age of Sigmar is also fine. Like, it's a pretty, pretty darn good game. But the, the limiting squad sizes is probably how it always should have been, as opposed to buying miniatures one at a time. I, I don't, I always ended up just sort of doing like min or max squads, like taking fives or taking tens. I never really took a lot of like seven models in a squad or four models in a squad. So I always, because you buy these things in boxes. And so I tended to take things based on how many came in the box. So it's not a huge change for me. I don't, I know a lot of people, especially people who are maybe a little bit more competitive would find that perfect balance. And you can math hammer everything, but doesn't math hammer take just a little bit of the fun out of it? Like if you're breaking everything down into mathematics and probability, all right, then why not just, why not just math hammer the gameplay? Like I get, I get like some people like Sean, if I, if, if Sean was sitting here, he loves Math Hammer and figuring it out and probability and figuring out the best possible. That brings him joy. But for me, I like to just grab stuff and see what happens. And that's what brings me joy. So there's definitely different people and like they, they have their different different perspectives on things. But I don't mind the men in the max squad. It's just some units it ends up being very awkward for like orc mega knobs. You can bring them in squads of two makes perfect sense to come in the box. The maximum squad is six. So if you ever want to bring any more than two, you have to buy two more boxes to get all the way to six. There probably should be three levels to the Orc Mega Knobs. There probably should be a points cost for two, a points cost for four, and a points cost for six. I think that that would just make things, you know, make it so that you can always take what you need or what you want, as opposed to, well, maybe I'll just ignore Mega Knobs altogether because I'm not buying three boxes. So maybe I don't even want to buy one box just to try them out. And it does create some weirdness with some more legacy things. My uh, Black Templar had a weird, I hope, flaw between their data cards and their points values, where it seemed like Crusader squads could be taken in squads of 5, 10, or 20. But then when it came time to get the points, the points were only there for 10s and 20s. I would like to bring a little five-man squad. Why can't I do that? I feel like I should be able to do that. But I can't do that because of the points. Technically, I could pay for the 10 and only take five. I would never ever in a million years do that because it would just be leaving points on the table. But it's it's a little bit awkward. I think that I think Games Workshop did an OK job of trying to get everything to the number of units that come in that box. I know a lot of people were arguing that this is something that is really good for new people, but it's kind of disrespectful or dishonest or bad for the veteran players. But do veteran players really want to be kind of jerked around with, well, I'll buy this box for two guys and then this box for one guy and then I have my best possible thing. It should all be one box. Every box should be one perfect unit ready for the tabletop. So I think with a little bit more added to the points cost of things, I think it can definitely be ironed out. Uh, Space Marines should be able to be taken, like regular tactical means should be able to be taken in a squad of five. It shouldn't be only locked to 10 because there's things you'd want to do where you only take five and there should, you know, you should be able to, well, you definitely shouldn't be able to go more because that's only for Black Templar. Only Black Templar players get to have a 20 man blob of space Marines. But it does seem like it, it, some people have argued that it takes all of the interesting stuff out of list building. 
but I would argue that Games Workshop sorta added that back with the new way that you actually build out your army, which is a character, and then whatever you want. There's no more, you must have three infantry, and then you can take up to three of each heavy support fast attack or elite, and then if you manage to get this like six troops, then you can bring more of the heavy, like all of that is gone. You just have to bring a character, which you're going to because they're very good, and then you bring whatever you want. And I think a lot of the complexity also comes in with taking your hero units like Chaplin, Reclusiarch, Merrick, Beverly, Grimaldus inside of a squad to buff them and to give them even better benefits when you spend your strategic ploys on them. I think that adds a lot more thinking into the game than just, hmm, do I want to take a squad of five orcs or do I want to take a squad of six orcs? I feel like that's not as interesting uh, a, a bit of strategy or a bit of list building as Hmm, do I bring a a not like a, a knob with wog banner or do I attach a pain boy? Like those sorts of decisions I think are a little bit more interesting. But the bigger change to Warhammer 40, and the very fundamental one, this one is huge, is all all war gear being free. This is this is wild. It's always been you buy your squad, and then you buy all of the weapons for your squad. But now it's just you buy your squad and all of the weapons have been baked in. And let me there's let me explain why this is awesome and why this is terrible. The reason it's awesome is because almost always in terms of list building, it's always better to have more dudes or to go really hard into one specific kind of spammy loadout than it is to just kind of give everybody a little something special. It's way better to bring your servitors with a with a uh, with a tech marine like a 40 little 40 point unit that gives you extra wounds and extra things to do on the battlefield then to dish out plasma pistols to all of your squad sergeants in your army but they, they all should have plasma pistols give put us put a plasma pistol on your squad sergeant live a little bit it's i think it's more fun to have the cool upgrade weapons on your guys and for the most part, I actually think this works out fine because most of the time it is just a situation of a special weapon plasma gun in the back of the squad or a plasma pistol on your sergeant. For armies like Necrons, it's barely a difference because Necrons have almost no war gear. We, it's almost all just one loadout per squad. So it almost feels like Necrons are the perfect faction for this new version of Warhammer 40,000. And some of the war gear options that we do have feel very balanced. Like Tachyon Arrow on the Warlord, one amazing anti-tank space laser shot, or Resurrection Orb, something that gives you the possibility of regenerating even more Necrons in your games. Like those two things, they're pretty darn close. But then you get into weird territory, particularly with older Games Workshop kits, like Devastator Squads for Space Marines. You can bring up to four heavy weapons in a squad, and there is an, a mountain of difference between four heavy bolters and four las cannons. And it puts you in these awkward situations of, even though like I might want to bring heavy bolters because that feels fun to roll tons of dice at 36 inches and just see what happens, but I'm just wasting my time because I've already paid for the las cannons for this squad because all of this stuff is balanced on the best possible loadouts. I even heard Sean during his list building stage saying, yeah, everything is defaulting to the best possible loadouts. And that is a little sad. Like it, that I think is much, it takes a lot more of the list building out of the game more so than just having stricter size squads. I, I, that does have flaws, but I don't think those flaws run as deep as I think a lot of people are worrying about because not that many units have war gear options that fundamentally change them as a unit. Like, and a lot of them are actually older kits like Space Marine bikes. You can kit them out with tons of special weapons and an attack bike with a multi melta, or you can run them as just a spammy bunch of guys with chainsaws. Two very different types of squads to do very different things coming in at very different points values. But because the points values are for those meltas, you're never really gonna want to take those chain sword spammy lists. What, well, you know, what do you do? Everything is broken, it's kind of a mess, nothing makes sense. I think Games Workshop already has the answer and they already do the answer and that is to just have more data sheets. And we've seen this for things like the Land Raider. You got your Land Raider Crusader, your Land Raider Redeemer and your Land Raider Classic. Three different data sheets, three different weapon option loadouts and different points costs. Works out perfectly. 
So I think that they should go through the codexes and find those units where war gear dramatically changes the utility of the units and then just make different war gear options a different data card. Space Marine Devastators, maybe have a Space Marine Devastator, you know, fire support with your bolt guns, heavy flamers, and gravity guns, which are all pretty darn similar in terms of what they can do on the battlefield. And then have like Devastator Destroyers, where you got your LAS cannons, your multi meltas, and your plasma guns. I think that that would be a super great way to handle it. Keep everything simple as it is, because I do really enjoy the free war gear, and it makes list building an absolute breeze, as opposed to adding up every single cost of every single gun. And I think it fixes things. I mean, Tau Crisis suits are in desperate need of this because man, do they have more weapon options than stars in the sky. Tyranid Warriors. There's a big difference between Tyranid Warriors with all oops all siding talons and Tyranid Warriors with venom cannons. Very different units do different things, but they come in the same box. So probably just split those off into different data cards. I don't know exactly why the Land Raider is like that, where there's these different variants that all do different things. I'm pretty sure that Games Workshop just kind of lucked into that because it used to be the biggest, coolest plastic kit you could actually buy. And so they gave it all of these different impressive sounding names. But just do that for all of the weird legacy things that don't quite work perfectly for free war gear. Because at the end of the day, it's not, it doesn't break the game. And actually, I think it actually makes it a little bit more interesting if every squad had all of their cool extra toys, because before, you would never really bring all of the little plasma pistols or the inferno pistols or all of those things because there's no guarantee that they'll do anything in the game. And are they worth those four points or do I just keep everything very vanilla and then splash out those points on the things that I actually intend to do a role in the game? And it'll just make the game a little bit more of a vicious and dangerous play zone where, you know, there is a melt gun hiding in that guard squad that there wouldn't usually be because they just decided to not bring any special weapons so they could bring more guard squads. Maybe that Votan unit hiding in the backfield, maybe they have a power fist back there. Why is it back there? Is it gonna do anything all game? I don't know, but it's there and it could mess up your game. I think that that is a much more interesting way to play the game. I just don't think that the system was perfectly implemented every, because especially with both of them right on top of each other, Free war gear in kind of locked squad sizes definitely is problematic right this second. And it'll be interesting to see if they come out with any fixes or changes or updates. There are a few things right now that are just outright wrong. Like for my Black Templar, my sword brethren can only be take can be taken in squads of five or eleven. That just seems incorrect. Like I'll take the extra guy, but he doesn't come in the box. So I don't want to buy an extra box so I can bring one other guy. I'm assuming whoever wrote that probably got Castellans confused as something else, where it's just the leader happens to be the leader of that squad. And so you just kit bash one guy to be to be holding a slightly better gun or a slightly better power weapon. But please comment below what you think of free war gear. Is this the end of Warhammer 40,000 forever? Or is it just a, a little change that and maybe it's for the better because I do like seeing more war gear on the board. I like gluing more war gear onto my guys. I think it makes them look a lot cooler on the shelf. And it just gets me a little bit more excited. Like, let's try gravity guns this game. Let's sneak a couple of those into the list where before I would just wouldn't even consider it because it would just be a waste of points because they have no dedicated task for that specific thing. But now they're free. I can just take them. And I'm really interested to see where Games Workshop goes from here. We've got the indexes. We've got this new system. What is a codex going to look like? Number one, our codex is going to be free because they better be. They absolutely better be. Games Workshop, you can't just, sh Nick's shaking his head behind the camera. You can't just give us free rules, give us all of Warhammer ready to go, and then say, okay, now Necron players don't get to play for free. I, you can have the old rules if you want, if you already downloaded them, because we're probably going to take them off of the website. But now you have to buy a codex to, that doesn't update automatically like the beautiful PDF online did. You have to buy a physical book with the rules in the back of it. That would be absolute garbage. Absolute garbage. I think if Games Workshop wanted to do anything, I think if they, even though Games Workshop has plenty of money and they don't need to do this, if they wanted to say, we need a subscription service, we're going to make you subscribe to an app. It's $2 a month or something. If it's cheap, I could probably stomach that if it had everything for all of their games, all of their systems. Whatever I want, I can see whatever rule, Necromunda, Aeronautica, Adeptus Titicanicus, 40k Age of Sigmar, if it was all there, ready to go, 
I think that would be something valuable. And then I can just unsubscribe to it for a few months if I stop playing the games. That would be absolutely fine. But don't do codexes. Game search if I'm begging you. Don't do classic codexes. I always say if you want to do codexes, do them, but don't make them essential. Keep the rules online, but also have the rules in the codex for people who want to play all completely offline. And then also have tons of artwork and lore in those books, maybe even certain chapters out of certain novels as flavor so that you can just super get engrossed into your into your force, because I would probably actually still buy the codexes then if every single codex was an absolute tome of information around my chapter and I could just sit there and read it. The codex has been pretty lame for a long time. I remember my fifth edition Necron codex was amazing and I would read it on the bus and every night before I went to bed. And then the sixth edition, or the, I think they skipped sixth edition, went right to the seventh edition codex, and it was the same lore, word for word. And then the eighth edition codex came out, and it was word for word the same exact lore. And the ninth edition one, they did change it up a little bit, and they sort of re, re you know, change, moved some stuff around. They got rid of some lore, added a little bit of new stuff. It was definitely a move in the right direction, but I'm excited to see what a tenth edition codex is. I'm sure I'm going to be very disappointed and it's going to be a very average Games Workshop codex printed in hardcover for some reason to help try to justify that crazy price tag. But they already showed us that the rules can be free and beautiful. Maybe there's a couple of little points values that are wrong here and there, but they'll fix it. It's a PDF. They can automatically update it. You can't show us that it all works seamlessly without us having to buy everything and then ask us to buy everything. It just doesn't work. Ah. I really like 40k 10th edition. I think it's looking good. Some stuff's a little wonky right now. I really do think that just having more data cards for certain units would just immediately fix everything. I mean, Tau Crisis suits just have one data card for super guns, one data card for normal guns, one data card for super, uh, close combat guns and flamers. It would just, it would fix everything. It would fix everything so beautifully. Games Workshop already does this for some units, like the Landspeeder, Landspeeder Typhoon, Landspeeder uh puddle land speeder ocean they're all nautical names just do that why the land speeder could be one data card it doesn't it's only it's all every kit has the exact same weapons in the box there's no different types of land speeders and yet the only reason that there's different data cards is because of legacy because they used to have these different names because way back in the day games workshop didn't sell that many plastic kits and so they had different names for these interesting units just do that for everything, for everything where War Gear can fundamentally change what a unit does. And when something should be dramatically more costed than other things, just split it into two data cards. It works perfectly. The only slight flaw would be that it would make some things a little bit more spammable, but you still can only bring three of each data card. So even if you wanted to spam like Lehman Russes, they would each have to be different groupings of Lehman Russes. And there really should be a cheaper Lehman Russ without all of the sponsons and extra weapons and just the main cannon. Because, like, the Lehman Russ is a classic kit, but right now, the only tank worth taking, or the only take you would tank, it, take is fully loaded, melt guns, las cannon on the front sponson, heavy uh, stubber on top, like, the works. And sometimes you don't need to bring a the works Lehman Russ. Sometimes you just need a cheap one. And you know what else just works? That's right, our Patreon. Over there, we have a brand new STL terrain set every single month. This month, we have the Gothic Modular Trenches, the perfect thing for your games of Warhammer 40,000 10th edition with options to make them both Imperial or Chaos. We also make one episode of Eons of Battle every single week where we take a look at our viewers' miniatures and give some ideas and critiques of how to improve their painting. We host live Discord hangouts, and we have a tier where you can get your name on one of my Black Templar Space Marines, and you can join the Immortal Crusade against Sean. And I guess Nyx Blue Orcs. Oh, and we also stream two nights a week, every Tuesday and Thursday from 5.30 to 8 p.m. Central Time over on Twitch. Warhammer 40,000 10th Edition is looking very interesting, and I do appreciate all of these changes, even though not every single one is my absolute favorite. It's reminding me a lot of 8th Edition, when things switched over from the old style of 40k to the new style of 40k, and now we're going from the new style to the new-er style. And I don't mind it. Thanks for watching.